history. So what happens in Genesis 3, if that's the explanation for all of human evil, for depravity, you would think somebody would quote it in the rest of the Old Testament, but they don't. So again, that's an issue. I want to start here with a reference to this book. I believe you could get, this is an expensive book, but it's the most exhaustive study to date on the issue that we're going to be covering. This is a study of prayers and ideological stories of the origin of evil in human history. Ideology is, is a big academic word that speaks of the point of origin, you know, how this, where this thing comes from. Uh, so ideological stories of the origin of, of evil in human history. And it is to date the most exhaustive study on this subject, and it is driven by primary sources. So this is going to be Second Temple Jewish literature. And they, that literature, as I've said many times before, you have people, they're, they're not just writing between the Testaments about anything. Okay, you know, just like, oh, what do we write about today? Let, let's just pick a subject. No, they are processing their sacred literature, the Hebrew Bible. And so that's what they're doing. And then in the process of doing that, the New Testament era, the first century, is part of the Second Temple period. And it's quite evident that New Testament writers, and again, wider people living in the first century, were either very acquainted with this literature, and in some cases, they actually allude to it or quote it, uh, in the case of the New Testament writers. So it, it has a, a serious there's a serious contributing factor. Again, we talk a lot about interpreting scripture in context here. And by context, we mean the original ancient context of the writers. Okay, you're not gonna be a writer in the first century and writing about the Hebrew Bible without knowing this material and dipping into it. And it's going to help, and it did help, the New Testament writers to articulate certain points. That's not in conflict with the idea of inspiration. Uh, any, anything more than just having your brain engaged would be in conflict with inspiration. Th th these, these things are not in conflict with inspiration. Now, I want to start off with, with Brand, and I'm going to quote from her dissertation. So this isn't the actual book, so I can't really give you page numbers of the book. But just to give you a flavoring of what she does uh, in her discussion of how did, how did Jews of the Second Temple people think about the entrance of evil into the world and again, human depravity. So in her study of, of prayers, you know, specifically these prayers that people, you know, prayed uh, about sin and evil and whatnot, protection and, and, you know, help with that. She writes, in those prayers that reflect a human inclination to sin, both sectarian and non-sectarian, what she means by that is, Anything from the Dead Sea Scrolls that was sort of produced by the community is viewed as a sectarian document, uh, the community who lived at Qumran. So in those prayers that reflect a human inclination to sin, such as 4Q, if you see a Q, it's from the Dead Sea Scrolls, 4Q, Barki, Nafshi, Psalm 155, the Hodayot, and the hymns of praise, or the hymn of praise in the community rule. In those documents, or documents like them, humans are generally described as subject to an innate inclination to sin, and that should sound familiar to us theologically, or even to a condition of sinfulness, again, that should sound familiar, sometimes described as a disease. Humans are unable to extricate themselves from this condition without divine assistance, that should sound familiar. It is for this reason that the supplicants turn to God in prayer, expressing their helplessness and, that, and God's goodness. The idea of an innate evil inclination that cannot be fought without the help of the deity is, again, part and parcel of this, this worldview, these texts. She goes on and says, passages in the Cave 1 version of the Community Rule, 1QS 5 and 6, and in the Damascus document, CD 3, and there you have the lines, reflect a belief in human free will concerning the decision to sin, and that should sound familiar, while still assuming that humans possess an innate inclination to sin. The human capacity to sin must be distanced from God and as part of the human condition. They solve the problem of theodicy, again, God's relationship to evil, in regard to sin by emphasizing human free will. She goes on and says, the idea that humans are sinful because Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden fruit, you know, quote unquote, original sin, is rarely found in surviving Second Temple literature. 
and let me just stop there. You'll, you'll, you also won't see that referenced in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament. So what happens in Genesis 3, you would think, if that's the explanation for all of human evil, for depravity, you would think somebody would quote it in the rest of the Old Testament, but they don't. So again, that's an issue. And, and I would even dispute that Paul is thinking of that specifically, at least he, he's, he, in Romans 5, 12, I don't think Paul is thinking of what happens in Eden the way typically theologians are thinking about it in the history of, of, of Christianity. He's, it, there's certainly some connection there. There's, there's obvi an obvious connection, but it's a little bit different, but I don't want to rabbit trail on Romans 5, 12 here. You can go to my website and look up the series I did on that. The earliest reference to this idea, again, there's, humans are sinful because Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden fruit, may be found in Sirach 25:24, which is again, part of the second temple period, which while referring to a wicked wife reflects a familiarity with an original sin tradition, whereby death and sin both originated from the eating of the forbidden fruit at Eve's instigation. However, only the two works written in the aftermath of the temple's destruction, so this is after 70 AD, 4th Ezra and 2nd Baruch explicitly present the idea that the desire to sin originated with the transgression of Adam and Eve. So that thing that, that's really familiar to Christian theology, church tradition, is really, really rare, really rare in Second Temple literature. Uh, and again, there, Paul does make some connection in his discussion of sin in Romans 5 with that event. Again, you could go to my website and, and look that up. It's not really part of the class here. On the other hand, so that's the human side. On the other hand, Brand writes, the reference to the sin-causing spirits of the watchers in 1 Enoch 19, 1 and 2 indicates that while the watcher's story, again, that's, the, that's Enoch's version of what happens in Genesis 6, you know, 1 through 5, while the watcher's story was not the explanation of the origin of sin, I mean, that happens back in the garden, it could be used to explain the occurrence of specific sins that might seem otherwise unreasonable, such as the worship of demons. The author or redactor editor of Jubilees, that's another book in the Second Temple period, also makes a bold move in order to quote unquote, fix the problem of the watcher's nature and origin. The watcher's descendants result from an act of rebellion and sin on the part of the watchers. That's the Genesis 6 episode. And consequently, they act without supervision from the divine sphere. They rebel. The author redactor of Jubilees clearly accepts that demons can in fact cause sin. However, he wishes to emphasize that these demons function within a divine system and cannot compel Israelites to sin. So in other words, they're the catalyst, but they're not the cause. And you know, our, our sins are not the effect. I mean, the, the, the devil doesn't make us do what we do. We, we, have, we have free will. But when it, when it comes to, you know, again, promptings or, or sort of being steered in certain directions, we have two problems as humans that Brand is saying, this is reflected in Second Temple Judaism. We have an innate sin problem, okay? But we also need to recognize Again, Second Temple Jews would say, we also need to recognize that there are these external spiritual forces that you know, sort of nudge us, steer us, uh, prompt us in certain ways to destroy ourselves, again, to proliferate evil. And, and what I'm suggesting is, I, I think that's a very biblical doctrine, but it has a history here in Second Temple Judaism, and specifically for our purposes today. Specifically, that trajectory is propelled by, it, it's, it can be traced to the episode of Genesis 6, 1 through 5, or in Second Temple language, the Watcher story.